Welcome back to class ladies. Today we'll be doing a poem. The title of the poem is The Woman Speaks to the Man Who Has Employed Her Son. This poem was written by Lorna Goodison. She's in fact a Jamaican. All right ladies, in today's lesson or in this week's lesson, we will be looking at the following. The objectives are to discuss the overall meaning of the poem, to identify the speaker of the poem, identify the poetic devices in the poem and explain them, identify and explain the themes in the poem using the examples from the poem. You are also going to be asked to identify the mood and the tone, and you're also going to be asked to identify the form of the poem. All of these objectives that have been listed to you will be discussed in this tutorial. All you have to do is pay close attention so that when you are given the activities to do, you will be able to quickly respond. Now, I would like to tell you a very short story before I get into the poem. It is the inner city. There is a mother. She has a son. He's an only child. His father does not take care of him. His father does not pay him any attention. And his mother is struggling. However, she's very hopeful that her son, her one boy, one pygmy, will come up to something good because they live in the inner city and there is violence. His father doesn't pay him any attention because his father does not pay any of his other children any attention. So he treats all of his children equally. This young man grows up without a father figure. And so he goes out and he seeks a father figure in the form of the Don in the community. Now, the mother of this young man would want her son to yes find a father figure but the example that she wants this father figure to show this young man is not the example that the don is showing this young man this young man has been given a gun by the don to do whatever deeds that he's doing the mother prayed she went to the don she begged him she asked him to release her son she asked her son to let go of the gun. He didn't listen. The Don didn't pay her any attention. She says to the Don, I thought you wanted to be a father figure to him because that's what my son says. But which father you know is going to give their son death in the form of a gun? And when she couldn't get anywhere with the Don, she couldn't get anywhere with her son she said i leave this to god i leave it at me city and she prayed and in her prayer she also asked for guidance she decided that being as no one will listen to her the don won't listen her son will not listen she is going to prepare herself for her son's inevitable demise she prepares herself she goes and she buys the material for his for a dress just so that when it is time because she knows within her heart that her son is going to die so she wants to be prepared for that funeral and she says, because you don't have a father, I am throwing partner. You know, when your parents get partner draw, we don't call it partner in Jamaica. We say partner. So she's throwing a partner. And she says, I have one hand in there for myself. And I have one hand in there for your father because I raised you twice. Because I am preparing for your funeral. And that's a sad story. But it's the reality of many single mothers in our country, especially when they live in inner city communities. Yes, there is a stigma attached to inner city communities. We call them ghetto. And yes, we know that ghetto is a state of mind. 
But the reality of it is that many persons will never see the inner city as anything but a ghetto. We know that there are great stories and great people that rise from the inner city, but how many of them are there? And so the story I just told you is the reality for many single mothers in the inner city. Something that we need to, to look at and evaluate. Now that story can be reflected in the poem I'm about to read to you that we're about to go through. Please note that the story I just told you is not the poem. I am going to now read the poem to you and we'll get into a little discussion. Let's go. The woman speaks to the man who has employed her son. Her son was first made known to her as a sense of unease, a need to cry for little reason and a metallic tide rising in her mouth each morning. Such signs made her know that she was not alone in her body. She carried him full term, tight up under her heart. She carried him like the poor carry hope. Hope you get a break or a visa. Hope one child go through and remember you. He had no father. The man she made him with had more like him. He was fair-minded. He treated all his children with equal and unbiased indifference. She raised him twice, once as mother, then as father. Set no ceiling on what he could be, doctor, earth healer, pilot take wings. But now he tells her he's working for you, that you value him so much you give him one whole submachine gun for him alone. He says you are like a father to him. She's wondering what kind of father would give a son hot and exploding death when he asks for bread. She went downtown and bought three and one third yards of black cloth and a deep crowned and veiled hat for the day he draw his bloody salary. She has no power over you and this at the level of earth. What she has are prayers and a mother's tears and at knee city she uses them. She says psalms for him. She reads psalms for you. She weeps for his soul. Her eye water covers you. She's throwing a partner with Judas Iscariot's mother and the thief on the left-hand side of the cross. His mother is the banker. Her draw, though, is first and last, for she's still throwing two hands as mother and father. She is prepared. She is done. Absalom. Now, ladies, this poem is riveted with images and euphemism and sarcasm and, and anger. But I want you to internalize what this poem is saying. A mother is crying out for help. A mother is seeking justice, if you want to call it, for the life her son has chosen. A mother has gone and asked the man that has, has employed her son, the Don, to release her son, to let him go. She questions, how can you say that you're like a father to him and yet still you want him to die? Now that's something to think about. Now I want you to understand that the speaker of the poem is not the persona. Now let's make a distinction. In many poems, there is only the persona, that is the subject of the poem or the person in the poem, the subject of the poem, yes? And the speaker is usually who the poem is about. The speaker is usually the, the, the persona. So we use speaker and persona interchangeably. However, in this poem, 
there is a third person. You know, like we say, there's a narrator in a story. So in this poem, somebody is telling us the woman's side of it. Somebody is telling us what happened. So the person that is telling us what happened, we're going to call them the speaker in this poem because the persona in this poem would be the woman and her son. That though They are the subject of what is being discussed in the poem. Now, what does this poem mean? What does this poem mean? What's the poem talking about? Based on the story I told earlier in our lesson and based on the reading of the poem, we know that the poem is very sad. We know that this mother is preparing for her son to be killed. Because as the saying goes, you live by the gun, you die by the gun. And she has done everything that she possibly can do. And now she has left it up to God at a time. In stanza one of the poem, and ladies, you will be provided with a copy of this poem so that you can follow the poem and the tutorial when you are doing your revision and your homework. In stanza one of the poem, we learn that the woman was pregnant, a metallic tide rising in her mouth each morning, morning sickness. And we know that she did not abort the child. She carried him full term tight up under her heart. She loved her son even before he came. And then she had him. In stanza two, we learn that this mother cherished her son so much that she says he's that hope hope you get a break or a visa you know that when you go to the embassy for the first time and you get that visa for many persons who have never traveled before for many persons when they get that visa it's like it's like a dream come through they are del um, delighted they're elated they're excited as yes so for her Having her son and knowing that this boy, this child, is her hope for something better in the future is what she was holding on to. And then the speaker informs us in stanza two that the, his father didn't care about him. That his father had many other children and he didn't care about him. In the line when the, the, the speaker says, the man she made him with had more like him. He was fair-minded. He treated all his children with equal and unbiased indifference. So his father didn't care. Stanza three tells us that she played both roles as mother and father. Now we know that mothers are usually the nurturers and fathers are the ones that are strict. She says the woman played both roles. So she punishes and she nurtures. Because she was the only one her son had. She says she didn't put a limit on her son. The speaker says the mother didn't limit him to what he could be. He could be anything. The sky was the limit. Anything at all. He could be. She had such hope for her son. But the tone changes in stanza three with the use of the word but. When you see the word but being used in a poem, you know that there is a contrast, a difference in the tone. And the speaker says to us, but now he tells her he's working for you. You and the you being mentioned in stanza three is the Don, the leader, the area leader, that bad man. And then there is sarcasm in the tone of the speaker. When the speaker says, you value him so much. <clears throat> you give him one whole submachine gun for him alone. Him alone control a gun. So you value him? Yeah, man. Now that is sarcasm, ladies. Because you can't value somebody and you give them their death. You can't value somebody and you put them in danger. But the young man emulates the Don. The young man wants to be like the Don and that's why he turned to him because he wanted a father figure. The mother questions, how can you be a father and you're giving this? How can you be a father figure and you're giving this young man who came to you? Who came to you for bread and bread could be maybe a job or food or something to keep him occupied. You gave him a gun. You care so much you gave him a gun? 
How does that make any sense? In, in stanza four, he says you are like a father to him. And she questions, how, how can a young man look at you as a father figure? And you basically want him to die. How do you sleep at night? And in stanza four, the speaker shows that that shows us that the mother has resolved to preparing herself for when her son dies. She has decided to get the material for his funeral for the day he draw his bloody salary. No bloody salary, hot and exploding death are what we call examples of euphemism. E U P H E M I S M. Now, the device euphemism is used when you want to say something mild to replace something that is harsh. When she says, or when the speaker says, hot and exploding death, we know it is going to be a violent death, but the speaker does not say violent death. She says, hot and exploding death right and the day he draw his bloody salary again that is an example of euphemism where the speaker is trying to put it mildly as to what it is that she wants to say about how the the son will die stanza five now in stanza five it's very important that we pay close attention to stanza five in stanza five it's a very powerful statement. It's something that mothers do for their children, no matter what. They pray for their children. She has no power over you. No, the you, the first you in stanza five is the dawn. She has no power over you. And this, the word this is used to describe the situation that the mother is facing right now. So she has no power over the Don or what her son is doing. Because she tried. She tried. She spoke. She tried. At the level of earth. So she tried everything in her power on earth. To get her son out of the clutches of the Don and his ways. But the speaker tells us that what the mother has are prayers. She's praying. She's at knee city and she's praying. And you know that mothers will go on fasting for you. For your protection. She goes to knee city and she prays. She prays and she cries. Now we know. I don't know if you are aware. But there is a, a little saying in Jamaica. Not a saying but a thought process in Jamaica. That when you make a mother cry for her child. And her eye water cover you. You are in trouble. When you make a mother cry for her child, you are in trouble. When a mother's eye water cover you, you know that you're not going to face a good ending. And so the speaker says that the mother has nothing but tears and prayers right now. And she's asking God to work in her favor. She says prayers for him. She says psalms for him. She says psalms for her son, for him. Now remember, the psalms can be used in two ways. They can be used as a prayer of protection and they can be used for destruction. Yes, I know you didn't know that. Fun fact. So she says psalms for her son, but she reads psalms for you. Now the you that she's reading psalms for is the done. She is reading the Psalms for him because she said, listen, you need to let go of my son. And if I have to go to the Bible for you, I'm going to do it. That's what she has because she's not powerless on earth. But she is powerful in the realm of heaven, the spiritual world. And she's saying that I'm praying for my son and I'm praying against you because you need to let my son go. She weeps for his soul. She's crying for her son's soul because physically she can no longer cry for him. She has done what she can. So again, spiritually, she is 
weeping for his soul. She's asking for the protection of his soul. But in the, the speaker says, her eye water covers you. And as mentioned before, when you make a mother cry for her child, it's problems. What popcorn said? Trouble daddy? <laughs> it's the last stanza. She's throwing a partner with Judas Iscariot's mother. No, the mention of the mothers in this last stanza. Biblical allusion. She's making a reference to events in the Bible without even saying much about the events. And she's not focusing on the children as much as she's focusing on the parents. She's throwing a partner with Judas Iscariot's mother. Yes? Pardon me. She's throwing a partner with Judas Iscariot's mother. Remember Judas Iscariot. He betrayed Jesus. How must his mother, how, how his mother felt? You know? How did his mother feel when to know that you betrayed the Messiah for 30 pieces of silver? She has now put herself in a category with the mothers or with parents who have been deeply hurt by their children. The thief on the left hand side of the cross, his mother is the banker. To know that your son was crucified, that was his punishment. This thief, to know your son was crucified for theft, how must that criminal's mother feel? To know that your son was put on public trial for stealing. To know that maybe she didn't raise him that way. The shame of it all. And this mother is putting herself in those women's shoes by, and this, that by the speaker mentioning all of this. But her draw though is first and last. For she's still throwing two hands as mother and father. Because remember, she raised her son twice. She was his mother and his father because there was no father in the picture. Now, the last line of this poem mentions Absalom. But before I go to that, let me finish the poem. She is prepared. The preparation that she has made is to throw the partner to pay for the funeral in case he dies because she's preparing for his death and to also buy the cloth and the hat ready to make that dress for the funeral. She is prepared. She is done. When somebody is done and they say that they're done, there is no going back. She is finished with all of this. She is prepared. She's done. Absalom. Absalom betrayed his father, King David, in the Bible. David went after his son because his son betrayed him with the enemy. This mother is being put in a category with parents whose sons have betrayed them and their teachings. But Absalom died. And you realize that <laughs> these three sons in the Bible died. Judas hung himself. The thief on the left hand side of the cross with Jesus. He was crucified. So you know, he died. And Absalom. Here got caught in a tree branch and flung from his horse and he, he died. Yes. King David was his father. No. The mother is disheartened. She has nothing else. She has nothing else. She has nowhere else to go. She, she can only turn to God. And, and so ladies, the poem is a very powerful poem. And as mentioned before, this is not new. These situations are not new. Where single mothers sometimes have to go through all of this. Now, we're coming to the end of this tutorial, but I want you to look at some themes before we finish the tutorial. We have betrayal. Yes, we have love. We have mother-son relationship. We have poverty because it is clear that the mother was poor. The family was poor. And that is why her son turned to the gun. 
maybe for survival. We have death. The mention of death. Stanza, the last stanza has death written all over it. The mere fact that the mother is preparing for the death of her son. The theme of death is evident. We look at also some devices, some poetic devices. And we know we, we also call them some literary devices. We can also call them figures of speech. There is euphemism, biblical allusion, metaphor. We have simile. We have alliteration. Now, you will be discussing these devices and these themes in your next class whether it is through a powerpoint presentation or through a video tutorial but you will be given the information and you'll be discussing you will also be given a few activities to get you up to speed on the general meaning of the poem but i do hope you have a good day ladies make good choices and if you can't make a good decision sit down meditate and think about issues that are affecting you your life and this world